Welcome back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. I'm here at the University of Wisconsin, where we're going to be speaking with Heinz Klug about his role as an ANC underground insider and his role on how he made his way here to the university as a law professor. Well, welcome, Heinz. Thank you very much, Steve. Well, maybe if we could start with how this thing happened in the first place. Uh, your background is fascinating. You were an ANC insider. You were in the underground. You went from South Africa to Botswana. Mm -hmm. Why did you do that? Well, I was a student activist during the 1970s. And uh, at some point in time, uh, it became in difficult to be inside the country. And I'd already been in touch with the ANC in exile. And uh, at the moment when the security police and uh, the army was trying to call me in, uh, I decided that it was best that I left the country, so I went to Botswana. And what did you do when you were in Botswana? So in Botswana, my official public role was uh, we set up, a, there was a news agency initially called SANA and later Solidarity News Service. And so we created this little news service which uh, gathered information from inside South Africa. The daily press was also available in Botswana uh, from South Africa, so we used to collate all of that and then uh, we sent it out. Initially, we just sent it out as a kind of bi-weekly pamphlet that went out to people around the world, the anti-apartheid movement particularly. Uh, but then eventually we got more sophisticated. We got a telex, and we used to telex the news to Lusaka and other points for the ANC also on a daily basis, uh, which managed to collapse that distance between uh, the ANC headquarters in Lusaka, Zambia, and what was going on inside South Africa. And if you can, for an American audience, help uh, Americans who may not be as familiar with this period, what was happening with the anti-apartheid movement in the United States at the same time? Well, at the same time in the United States in the 1970s, after the 1976 student uprising inside, inside South Africa and the killings by the police of, of people on the streets, and that was covered in t on TV for the first time. Uh, the reaction of people in the United States was a lot of anger, there was calls for boycotts, and the anti-apartheid movement in the U.S. really got going. Uh, but then, as happened in many parts of the world, after, by the late 1970s, it had kind of uh, quietened down again. And then in the early 1980s, as activity started developing in South Africa again, and that, you know, you refer to the, the underground role, and I'll talk about that in a moment, uh, we see a situation where, uh, again, people in the U.S. start picking up on that, and start the campuses, particularly the students, start reacting to that. And so you have the development of the student movement in the United States, across the United States, an anti-apartheid movement that's uh, led partly by the students, but also partly by black civil rights leaders. Uh, there's the demonstrations in Washington, D.C., in front of the South African embassy. And eventually, uh, in 1986, the passage of the uh, United States Congress's Anti-Apartheid Act. And while that was going on, in, in Botswana, so you referred to the underground, so you were doing both this press work and what was the underground work? So the underground political work, particularly uh, from late, from 79 when I arrived in Botswana, uh, for right through, uh, was initially very much political work. Uh, we were uh, building uh, communities of activists inside South Africa, creating ANC units uh, that were pol mainly political units, uh, organizing uh, uh, various groups in order to do pamphleting, to make the presence of the ANC known, uh, and also to uh, distribute the ideas of the ANC. Uh, the Freedom Charter had been formed in 1955, but it was only, you know, its celebration in 1980 was the first time it really re-emerged publicly inside the country. And there were all sorts of interesting little things like the fact that the Freedom Charter itself hadn't actually been banned. And so it could be published in a newspaper in 1980. Uh, before the regime realized what was happening. And so it was that kind of political work uh, that the underground was doing initially at first, and of course very quickly ties in as well with the fact that you've got the Umkonto Wesizwe, the military wing, operating as well, and uh, the linking of those two political project and the military project to uh, heighten uh, the struggle inside South Africa. And speaking of that linkage, you were in both. Yes, I was uh, um, in the political underground, but as those things began to interact with one another, I was sent for training in 1982 uh, to Angola, where I trained uh, with Mkonto Wesizwe, and then I was played, you know, back in Botswana. Uh, but you know, the, the roles that we played in Botswana was mainly, my role at least, was mainly a political role. Well, I think your background is so interesting because 
you're a law professor now mm -hmm. and you're a specialist in constitutionalism, but meanwhile, back as a kid, you were doing a lot of stuff that mm -hmm. was, shall we say, not constitutional. <laughs> it was neither constitutional nor legal at the time. Uh, and, you know, I, I often say that, you know, my relationship to law at the time was somewhat problematic in the sense that I understood that what I was doing was outside of the laws of South Africa. But then we didn't consider apartheid law to be legitimate law. And so one of the interesting discussions I have my, with my students is at what point in time does a law become so unjust that it's justified to actually break it, to consciously be outside of the law? Well, in fact, I, I, I'm glad you raised that because that's what I actually was hoping that we could chat about. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in contemporary uh, United States civilization and civilizations around the rest of the world, at what point does a law become something that can be broken if it's unjust? Well, I mean, it's interesting because uh, y there's, there's obviously various stages of that. Uh, you have a situation where, uh, like in the civil rights movement, where there's clearly laws that can be broken uh, to show that they're unjust, whether it is the laws preventing people from sitting at a, a counter or laws that say that people can't uh, sit on a park bench or where they have to sit in a bus. Uh, those can be very peacefully resisted simply by sitting down and th so there's a whole tradition in the United States now of civil disobedience and, and picking which laws exactly. And different people, of course, will have different views on what laws they wish to object to. And as long as they engage in, in civil disobedience, that seems to be part of the culture and an acceptable way to respond to laws that one considers unjust. The question is, is when would ev one ever be able to go beyond that? And clearly in the South African situation, we went beyond that. Uh, to the point where we would active resistance uh, to the point of armed resistance uh, for the African National Congress. And what the conversation that I have with folks is, well, at what point did the ANC decide to actually take up arms? And I think that decision is a, a very difficult decision for anybody. And it's a decision for the ANC. It was a long discussion, a, a very controversial discussion. And it had to do with, would the other side actually permit you to actually demonstrate? peacefully without just shooting people dead on the street. And you know, they showed before at Sharpville in 1960, in Soweto in 1976, that children marching down the street would be shot at with live ammunition and killed. That's not possible then to say to people, you have to resist peacefully uh, in the face of that. What does that mean? Uh, Gandhi, interesting enough, always, who was a proponent of peaceful resistance, always said that if the other side is prepared to just slaughter people uh, with live ammunition, then it's not possible to actually engage in that kind of resistance. Uh, so there's a limit to peaceful resistance uh, because what's the alternative? At the end of the day, the alternative is to sit down and accept the authoritarian response, the authoritarian situation. And uh, particularly in a situation like apartheid, it had got to the point already in the 1960s uh, but clearly by the 1970s and 80s that one, one's choice was to resist or to accept and uh, we could not accept that unjust system. What if somebody believes to their core that we're destroying the earth with some of the stuff that we're doing in terms of the climate mm -hmm. and they want to prevent an energy company right. from delivering energy? Right. Are they justified in stepping up and saying, well, we're going to prevent that energy from flowing? See, from my perspective, the question becomes, so at what, what point would you be justified to do that? The only point I think that one is justified to do that is if all the political and legal mechanisms are not available to you. If at some point in time there is no democratic congress, where, where there's no democratic elections, uh, there's no ways to actually pursue a legal case to show the world that there's a problem. Think about a lot of uh, litigation that happens uh, for, in, for social movements. That litigation is not to expect to win, but it's to expect to demonstrate to the world what the problem is with that law. And so cases are brought. When, those are, when that is all foreclosed, that is the moment when any conversation would have to be about what to do. We know there are people who are prepared to chain themselves to a pipeline uh, in civil disobedience. Well, those are forms of dis civil disobedience which people, that's a legitimate activity, 
of course what happens is people then get arrested and, and suffer the consequences by the law. Uh, but as long as that is a process, an acceptable kind of process, where the law is also behaving within its limits and not uh, beyond that, uh, then I don't think it's justified to actually take up arms. Interesting. And, and, and so in terms of the issue of that pathway, so why would somebody in power who really doesn't agree with the opposition, why would they allow constitutional change that would help the opposition? Well, so if they, if they are in any way committed to being a democratic power, they have to acknowledge that if they lose an election or if they uh, suppress speech, that that doesn't allow a democracy to continue to flourish. Uh, and that's absolutely true. We see leaders all over the world who want to argue that, uh, uh, that the opinion of the people is unjust, that it's been manipulated, and only they know the truth. Uh, that is not a democratic way to approach the world. And you know, what was interesting is even in the anti-apartheid resistance, the, if you take the United Democratic Front and other organizations, were very committed to democratic practice to the extent that they possibly could within themselves. And so it's that commitment to actually be democratically engaged that really matters. And what was interesting is even in the underground structures where obviously in those conditions of illegality, it's not easy, you can't be open, uh, but um, in, among the people engaged, there was a real commitment to talking things through, to, to trying to be as democratic as possible, despite the conditions. Well, that is interesting, but what if the other side doesn't even believe in democracy at all? Well, that becomes the point where they are foreclosing on the possibility of change. They're foreclosing on the pos possibility of political activity, of democratic activity. And that's the point where people mobilize demonstrations, where one can engage in civil disobedience. And at the moment when they are going to even prevent that kind of objection, that kind of demonstration, that kind of democratic expression, that's at the moment where the conversation becomes, well, what to do next? And in terms of constitution writing, which you're an expert in, in doing, um, how do you build into these constitutions some of the mechanisms that enable people to do what we're talking about? Well, I mean, that's, that's interesting, right? So there's a lot of debates about the relationship between democracy and constitutionalism, because after all, constitutionalism in a way uh, limits pure democracy in the sense of kind of parliamentary sovereignty in the British sense. But at the same time, that is a form of constitutionalism. So you have to decide how democratic the system actually is and can the constitution encourage and make democracy. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, you take the US constitution, it's protections of freedom of speech. Uh, I wish it explicitly protected the right to vote, for instance. Uh, when constitutions can actually provide those protections, then first of all, you know, that's a statement to the community and to the world, that's what we expect. That's what the people have rights to. So rights is one way to do it, but of course it's also structure. So the fact that you separate powers, that you create increasingly modern constitutions are creating independent uh, institutions within them. Those kind of mechanisms, can you put them into the Constitution, independent kind of mechanisms that uh, will ensure that, for instance, if the legislature is no longer hearing the voice of the people, is there somewhere else people can go? Uh, Etienne Morenik, a South African academic, legal academic, who um, argued that the idea is that, that to give people many bites of the cherry. So if you cannot win in one place, do you have somewhere else to go? Are you able to raise the issue? Are you able to go to court? Are you, doesn't mean that you must be guaranteed a win in any of those places, but can we air these issues? That's the way a constitution and democracy can enhance democracy, as opposed to uh, this idea that somehow, uh, you know, courts and constitutions are separate from democracy. But how do we make sure that it really remains accessible. I mean, one of the criticisms of the US system mm -hmm. in terms of our courts is that it takes so much money and so much time right. to protect your rights. No. And, if, and if that is happening, then is it really accessible to the average person who is trying to protect their rights? I think there's two parts to that. The first part is that uh, there's no question that courts take time. 
Right? And now, time is, is, is a bad thing when you feel your rights have been violated and you want them vindicated. Time is not a bad thing when it comes to allowing a political process to play out a little bit further. Uh, courts often, for instance, require you to start at the lowest court and bring it through the courts to see the ideas develop and to see the options be considered by a series of court before the final court makes a decision, like the Supreme Court. So the, the issue of time on the one hand is one thing. The issue of resources, I think, is, is a much more important problem where many people just don't have access. Uh, and I think any decent democracy will find ways to provide resources that allow people to gain access to the courts. I think it's very sad in the United States that we do not fund it any longer the kind of uh, lawyers, rural lawyers, community lawyers that were funded in the 60s and 70s, or after the 60s, in the 70s particularly, which enabled more and more people to get actually access to the courts as one place in which they could bring up their issues and, and, and vent their issues and allow people to have the conversation and see these different ideas. Uh, today we have a lot of well-funded uh, you know, social movement legal uh, bodies that do bring cases. But as you say, for the common person who feels that somehow the system's not working for them, it's very hard to get into the courts. But it's also equally hard to get to the political process. What does it mean to get to your congressperson or get to your senator and get them to actually take up your issue? Uh, and again, I think there has to be an understanding that both sides need to do that. And what about students? So we're here at the University <coughs> of Wisconsin mm -hmm. Law School. So what can students do to prepare for, one, learning about this, and two, getting involved in this professionally? Uh, you mean the kind of constitutional debates? Well, I mean, it's interesting. The, uh, in, obviously, our constitutional professors teaching constitutional law get students to debate the issues all the time. Uh, I've got the privilege of uh, offering a course this coming fall, for instance, which is a simulation course on constitution making. And the idea there is, of course, we understand it's very difficult to change the United States Constitution. But state constitutions actually have changed historically much more regularly. And so to get students to think about what does it mean to actually formulate constitutional provisions? Uh, because it's not the same as statute writing. It's not the same as we need to write it as clear as possible. Uh, because we know when different people are negotiating something like a constitution, the key is that all sides can imagine a future for themselves in this document. Uh, because if you write it up and it, it makes it clear that I have no place in this society, then why should I go along with it? Why should I support this? So I must at least imagine that I'll be able to pursue my own interests within this. And to that extent, the language is often written fairly vaguely so that I can imagine it has my meaning rather than your meaning and you can imagine the same. And, and so it's a very different, it's a, a question of what I think about is constitutional imagination. And so what I'm really interested in doing is, is improving their constitutional imagination. What kinds of systems around the world, so I use the comparative approach to do this. Uh, so when we talk about electoral systems, think about all the different kinds of electoral systems that exist around the world, not just first past the post. And debate it. So get the students to think about these things. And at some level, of course, it's very political, but at the other level, it's, it's not. When we talk about social and economic rights versus uh, the regular kind of civil and political rights, what does it mean to have those kinds of rights in a constitution? Uh, many state constitutions, for instance, have a right to education. What does that mean? How does one implement that? Uh, and so get, making people think about that. What are the limits of courts? Uh, you can go to a court and they can give you a decision, but then the rest of the system has to respond to that decision, has to actually accept that decision. And so what's that interaction? And getting students to think that through, I think, is, is a way to get them to think about being involved in that in the future, in their communities. I mean, think about it, every town, every chess club has a constitution, right? They have their set of rules by which they work. Uh, and the way I, I, I try and begin this is to get them to think about who decides? And how do you decide? So just to get them as a class to sit together and say, how are you going to decide to make decisions as a group? Are you going to have vetoes on each other? Are you going to set up a situation where somebody gets to say no uh, and stop everything? Or, or is it just simple majority by one? Is that good enough? Or do you want a little greater majority? Do you want a two-thirds majority before you're all happy that you'll accept it? 
how many people are you prepared to leave out and still think that you can keep this thing acceptable to everybody? But what about understanding issues of the rights and responsibilities? So we talked about the rights before, but what about responsibilities? How do you balance that? Some people would say, okay, we keep talking about the rights, but why aren't we talking about what our obligations are? No, I, th I, I, I take that point, and I think that that is actually a, a really important point. Uh, we don't think of, we in fact, we often use, hear people object when they suggest that a constitutional laws would have duties on citizens, that somehow this is a violation of freedom, uh, of liberty. Um, and so maybe instead of framing it as duties, uh, one can think of it more softly as obligations. What obligation does one ever have to a community that one's part of? Well, very simply, if you expect people to be there when you need them, then maybe we should start thinking about, am I there when somebody else needs me? Uh, because, you know, a storm comes through and my house is washed away, and I look to the community and I need help. Uh, and unless I think beforehand that when I'm fine, uh, what about those people out there that may need something? What can I do? And for me, that gets right back to the real basics. Do I pay my taxes? And I pay, I pay my fair share of taxes. Instead of thinking that the tax is something that the government takes from me, I think about it as something that I'm putting into the community so that the community will be there when I need it as well. So it's not, it's not purely giving. It's actually providing the context in which uh, I will also be given to when in my time of need. And it's that kind of understanding and building that in fairly early that, in fact, um, you know, what was it, Oliver Wendell Holmes who said that the price of civilization is tax. Well, going forward, so now that you're a constitutional expert and a law professor, what advice do you give to governments that you might deal with or people thinking about some constitutional change? Are you trying to encourage them, obviously, to have the pressure points that you talked about, but specifically, what are you asking them to actually do when they're writing the constitutions? The point is, is to, as, and maybe it's my very academic perspective, is to talk to people about what alternatives they are, what have been the experiences in other places, uh, what happens uh, when you make one choice as opposed to another. Um, all the choices have their limitations, uh, but they, unless people have a sense of what these alternatives are, they very easily can be told or given the impression that there's only one way to go when there are multiple you know, opportunities and ways to actually enhance democracy and to build a, a more just society. And obviously in communities where there are serious differences, otherwise they wouldn't be talking about constitution making, how does one try and meet those differences? How does one try and engage those differences? Uh, I think that's more the contribution that I can give as opposed to say, well, I really think this clause is the best kind of clause for protecting property or equality or some other element. Uh, you know, what does it mean to do that? And, uh, you know, you, there's, a, there's a wonderful website called Constitute, which you can look up. It has all the constitutions of the world on it, and you can pick and choose language and plunk it in, but that won't actually do anything for you unless you as a community as a constitution making body has ac have actually thought it through and argued about it among yourselves and try to work out what it's going to mean for you and know that down the road when cases are brought and it goes before judges those meanings will change but at least you understand the process so if i heard what you just said a second ago you really view yourself as a facilitator uh, that's how i'd think of myself as facilitating constitutional conversation not some dictating that this or that is, is best. That's interesting. And so as a professor, you're also a facilitator in a way as well. Yes. I mean, I, I hope that what I can facilitate is that my students learn something that they actually learn to engage with one another and uh, develop their understandings of the world. Well, fair enough. We only have a few minutes left, I think. Um, is there anything that you wanted to share about your time in the underground or anything you wanted to share about your time here as a professor that you think would be helpful for a current uh, law student or college student to, uh, to, to hear? Um, well, that's a kind of difficult question uh, to think back of a, of a, a very varied uh, uh, career. You know, I think it's really been committed to engagement 
committed to, you know, whether you're studying or, or whether you're engaged in political activity, uh, the, you know, the first rule is to be there, to be present, to be engaged. Um, in, in many ways, what's interesting is people who are more engaged uh, in their work are often even more engaged in fun. Uh, that you realize that you've got to live life to the most that you can in every way that you can. Uh, so, you know, just because you're serious about your work doesn't mean you don't get to enjoy yourself as well. Uh, but that, that balance is really important. And that being able to, to work on that balance and to work with other people um, and learn from other people. Uh, I was astounded in, in my time of learning from people who came from totally different backgrounds uh, from totally different histories and uh, being thrown together in, in these circumstances and having to rely on one another uh, to, to quite a, to a very high extent, uh, but to actually be able to be open to learn. I think that's the key. And, and I guess the one thing I would f ask you about, if I can, is the sure. issue of, you, you raised the issue of fun. Um, and I hope you don't mind me asking you this question about your personal life, but my understanding is that you had to ask permission of Oliver Tombo to get married. <laughs> uh, is that so? Uh, that is true. Uh, it wasn't the, the question that I'd ask it of Oliver Tombo personally. It turned out that I did get to meet with, uh, with Oliver Tombo, and he was the one who actually gave me permission. Uh, but it's a situation where uh, members of the underground who were in, particularly in the forward areas around South Africa, uh, I suspect that you know we, we carried a lot of knowledge in our heads about people inside the country who that needed to be protected, uh, and so when one was going to go off and get married, the assumption is is that it's very hard not to share information with one's partner. One assumes that even if one doesn't want to, one's likely to share, and maybe one should be sharing. And so the organisation had a real interest in what that was about, uh, and also there was a kind of uh, uh, paternalism, if you like, uh, from the senior members. And, uh, and so the attitude was is that uh, if you want to, I mean, it's a voluntary organization, right? At that, particularly at that time in exile, uh, people could walk away. And particularly people had a uh, few resources, could easily just go somewhere else and say, I'm not interested anymore. And so that kind of cooperation was important. And so uh, at the point where I was going to, uh, wanted to get married, um, it was understood that I should ask permission. And so I found myself in Oliver Tumbo's office in uh, um, headquarters in Zambia. And, uh, you know, he, he listened to my story. And it turns out that he knew of this family uh, that I wanted to marry into. And uh, he, you know, he said, yes, absolutely. Uh, so that was. It was quite extraordinary, of course, getting a chance to actually work with Oliver Tumbo. He's an extraordinary man. Uh, but yes, I'm proud of that fact. Well, that's a great way to end this uh, segment. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you would like additional information about the University of Wisconsin, please go to wisc.edu. If you would like additional information about the show, please send me an email directly, if you'd like, to highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.